One thing that a lot of people don't know about me is that I actually pre-plan every single build and schedule it in accordingly in order to keep good organization on you know how many builds I have at any given time. And this is done to a science where I know exactly where, oh crap, look at that impulse buy. Hey everyone, this is John from EastCoastArmory.com and I'm here today with a model showcase video for this 135th scale German World War II SDKFZ 232 Achtenraden armored car. The model in this video is built for my own personal collection, it's not for sale and or purchase. However, like I often mention in these build videos, I frequently take on commission build projects from models ranging between 135th scale and 16th scale. For availability and pricing information, that info would be best by contacting me through the email address listed below, which is info at eastcoastarmory.com. The model that we have here is built predominantly out of the box. However, I had to step outside of the kit confines in order to get the model fully completed to the condition that we have here. As for why this was the case, well, we're going to be going over that in this video, as well as going over several of the other aspects and details that are supplied with this kit. And this also includes, of course, giving the model a thorough inbox review. So stay tuned because there's going to be a bunch of info coming right at you. To start this video off, let's go ahead and take a quick walk around this model. And this vehicle here is the World War II German SD KFC 232 Schwere Panzerspeifachen. And that is just a big fancy German word of meaning heavy armored reconnaissance vehicle. This was a purpose-built eight-wheeled armor car that was designed by the German military in the late 1930s time frame. This vehicle saw wide usage with the Wehrmacht during the early portion of the war, be it in the French campaign, as well as also into the North African campaign, to name a few. Unlike some of the other armor cars that were designed during this era, where they were mostly just starting off as a standard truck that were then built upon into an armor car format, the Achtenradens were actually purposefully built for this role. These vehicles were quite large in their overall size, however, that didn't affect their performance and these vehicles were actually quite fast despite the large size and weight. These vehicles here were able to hit a maximum speed of about 50 miles an hour, which again for a vehicle of this size and dimensions is pretty astounding. The reason for the high speed was because these vehicles were intended for a reconnaissance role. They were meant to probe to see if there could be any weaknesses for the rest of the forces to exploit and therefore the speed was going to be necessary. Because they had 8 wheel drive this made them very capable on running on most off road conditions. Probably the most interesting and noteworthy aspect on this family of vehicle are the idea of having two drivers. The concept is that if you're driving the vehicle and you need to go into reverse for one reason or another, instead of having the single driver you know, put the thing in reverse and try to back up going blind, you have a secondary driver with a duplicate set of controls and this person can see out of the rear portion of the vehicle with much greater ease and operate the vehicle in a more controlled manner. Keep in mind this is, you know, many decades before the advent of backup cameras and LCD screens, so the idea of the secondary driver was one that actually worked out quite well. Because of this, if the vehicle was in a jam, it can easily back up as fast as it got into trouble in the first place. This this design feature would carry over from this family of vehicle to the next generation of Achtenradens on vehicles like the Puma. Another very interesting design feature I carried over into the next generation of German armored cars was with the concept of having all eight wheel steering. This again was done to give this vehicle added maneuverability with combination of the great speed was definitely something that gave this vehicle a bit of an edge performance wise. The hull was very adaptable and was suited for different roles, however this particular version here had a fully enclosed turret. The turret had two forms of armament, a standard MG34 as well as a 2cm KWK30 L55. However, the number one feature that cemented this vehicle in all of history is with the external appearance of the radios. This vehicle particularly had two radios installed, one short range and one medium range radio, and because of that, it had a gigantic, very prominent antenna found on the exterior of the vehicle, quite commonly known as the bed frame antenna. The antenna covered basically almost the entire length of the vehicle and was supported on the rear section as well as also from a frame mount that's found on the turret. 
These vehicles were produced from the late 1930s to about 1943 or so, and at that time production was halted on these vehicles because they were going to tool up the next generation of Achtenradens, being the 234 family of vehicles. In total, roughly about 900 some units were produced, which was actually quite substantial, and this vehicle here was, again, quite prominently used by the German military in the early stages of the war. Before we go any further with the video, let's go ahead and take a step back to when this model was first started in order to get a good idea on what the base starter kit supplies you with. And here's the model at the start of the build. For the base starter kit, I'll be utilizing this really cool 1970s vintage Tamiya Schwer Panzerspeewagen Achtraden SDKFC 232. And if that's not an awesomely German sounding name, I honestly don't know what it is. So this model here, as I mentioned before in the pre-video bumper, is a impulse buy by every definition of the term. And I literally just picked it up a few hours ago from the military vehicle show that I just got home from. And of course, yes, I did film several videos of real military vehicle walkarounds. And yes, they are posted on the channel, hopefully by the time this video drops. As for this model here, well, it is a... Vintage Tamiya kit from the 1970s, specifically Tamiya released this kit in 1974 and this is a kit that I've been wanting to get now for a long time. This is one of those kits that I always used to see in the old school Tamiya catalogs. I would see it from time to time floating around hobby shops and model shows and such, but you know for whatever reason I never got it. But finally I actually was able to have my pats cross with another one and here it is on the table right here. This model was in a bin full of other old vintage kits, which a few of them I also did buy, spoiler alert, and the vendor was actually selling them for a pretty reasonable price. The model is already open. It was obviously owned by another individual. The person who acquired this model acquired it in a lot with a bunch of other models from an acquisition, and he was basically just you know selling off the inventory which is pretty commonly seen on how one would acquire a vintage kit from time to time, either on eBay or, you know, in a flea market type setting. The model was actually sold at a discount, and I actually also haggled the price down a little bit because of the condition that the model's in, and you will see that once the model is opened. And this is a bit of a trick I want to tell people, specifically if you're younger and you're getting into the hobby and you're stumbling across, you know, kits like this at a, at a venue like this, you always want to haggle your way down because if a model is in a certain condition, i.e. it's opened, it's, it's pre-owned, in several occasions, it's going to be a roll of the dice. And sometimes the model is intact and sometimes the model is not. And if you purchase the model at full price or even for a price that's greater than really what the model's worth and it's missing some pieces, yeah, it stings pretty bad. This actually has happened to me in the past. I have gotten burned on a few models that I bought where I thought it was fully intact and it was missing the whole turret. So obviously it's something you really have to pay attention to. And on this one here, I actually picked it up from the vendor and I was able to haggle the price down. The model was originally 25 bucks and I was able to get $5 knocked off it because of the inner contents, but you'll see more of that when I get to that. As for this particular kit here, like I stated before, these kits were released by Tamiya in 1974. This was when Tamiya was really just chugging on all cylinders and they were making a large number of kits in both World War II and also from the modern at the time era, I should say. And this kit was another classic model kit. It's been around forever and it's also been in and out of production for various times. To me themselves would actually re-release this kit in recent years. It's the exact same tooling, however they upgraded the parts a little bit by adding some extra features to it. That model, you can see the box are popping up right now on screen. And as cool as that kit is, and I wouldn't mind picking one up at some time down the road, there's just something about these older ones that really just have a mystique to them. Specifically to me, because again I am a bit of a classic model kit fan. But as for this one here, well, let's go ahead and go and look at the box art and graphic design. So of course, being a Timia box art, white background, no frills to it, and we have the vehicle's illustration right there, prominently seen. The vehicle is the same type of illustration quality which is seen on other Timia kits of this era, and which, you know, means the illustration is nicely rendered out. 
From the illustration it takes to the remainder of the graphic design, which is quite typically seen on these Tamiya German tank models, and it always looks very aesthetically pleasing, or at least I always found. Here we have the Tamiya logo in the right hand corner. Generally it's usually in this section over here, sometimes it's higher, sometimes it's lower, but in this case because of the title section it's the latter. We have some more info written over there in Japanese. We have other features found on the top portion over here written in English. Quite, you know, typical scene on these Tamiya kits. On the side tab we, over here we have the vehicle's thumbnail. Now if I'm not mistaken I believe this may be a recent release. I'm not sure if this kit was directly a 1970s release because it is an MM listing with the dual green circles. And this is something generally seen on Tamiya kits from the 1990s era. And although the box is definitely old, you can see it has that yellowing color going on with the with the white. It's definitely not nearly as old looking compared to some of the other vintage Tamiya kits that I personally have in my collection. But regardless, obviously the tooling inside is definitely the old school version. As I said before, this is kit number MM36, which is quite interesting because generally when I'm used to working on these Tamiya kits, there's usually a one or a 200 range, but 36, yeah, it shows you just how early these kits were designed in Tamiya's lineup. We have some other really cool info over here in the typical Tamiya typeface. We have another little color option of this vehicle, but with a dual tone camouflage scheme. Info written in Japanese. We have the copyright right over there, 1974. And as you can see, it's made in the Philippines, which definitely tells me that this kit is a 1990s release. The reason why I say that is because in the 80s and into the 90s, Tamiya moved their manufacturing from Japan to the Philippines. And that's when you started seeing the little MMs in the circle, as opposed to the older kits, which were produced in Japan and then were distributed in the United States by MRC. So this year is definitely one of the relatively recent re-releases of this kit, but is definitely something to consider, specifically if you're going to collect these and not build them, perhaps it's something to keep in mind. On the other portion over here, you can see the side tab. As I stated before, the kit was originally $25, but I talked the guy down a little bit. And on this side here is the, what I like to call the cocktease tab, which is something that if you grew up in the 90s, you would always oogle over, and these things were just unobtainable. These were box arts of some of the other Tamiya kits, but the funny thing is was that in the 90s and even in the 80s, these kits were long out of production and they did not have these really killer box arts. These were the ones that had the motorization and the, specifically the dual remote or the dual motor gearbox that were present on them, which is why they had the really killer box art. So let's take a look at some of the really excellent scenes, which by the way, in my opinion, these were some of the best box arts ever made on plastic models. So here we have the Yag Tiger, the Centurion with that really distinctive coming at you box art, M60A1 which they actually re-released with this box art about 10 years ago and I actually did one of those reissues, can be found on the channel. The original KV1, not the one with the crappy Lincoln Link tracks. And also the infamous Godzilla fan Type 61 Japanese medium tank. Also, obviously it's a 1990s release with the barcode right over here and the Grun Punta uh, little recycling circle thing. It's a European thing, I'm not really sure what it is, but all of these definitely of course indicate that this is not an older kit that was produced in the 70s. Of course the tooling dates back to that, but actually, you know what, let's go ahead and open up the box right now. So opening up the box to reveal the kit's contents, this is an entire injection molded plastic kit. There's no other modern amenities like photo etch or metal or anything like that. This is as old school as you can possibly get. So starting with the hull, here's where you get to see the tooling of the hull. Obviously this vehicle would be very similar to the ones that came afterwards, i.e. the Puma, but this one here always has more of a big doofier you know, look to it in comparison to those other later design vehicles. Having said that, the Tamiya kit is very nicely rendered. Keep in mind, this is 1974 tooling, and considering the age of tooling, this kit did age remarkably very well. As I stated before, Tamiya themselves would basically re-release this kit with just a small few modern amenities added to it, but by and large, it's the original one from the 1970s. The plastic is nice and thick, be a nice sturdy model once fully assembled. 
It's got some hinge detailing on it. The undercarriage is decently rendered, again, for the scale and the era. We got here the bottom portion of the engine. It's I like the way they molded that into the bottom portion over here where it's open on this side and on the back. Gives the illusion of depth and that there is an engine compartment when there is no interior detailing, or at least as far as I can tell from the images I've seen and on the instructions. So it's a purely exterior model, which is perfectly fine. Carry on from the lower portion takes us to this runner here. I'll go ahead and pop this guy open. This run, or I should say, this bag was previously opened by the original person who once owned this model kit. And then was resealed up at some point, either by the vendor or by the original owner. And this is where you're going to start seeing some of those things come to life. You'll notice on this area here, it is missing some components. And this is going to be a common trait with this model because it is not 100% intact and it is missing some parts here and there. Fortunately, I was able to, well, one, the vendor who sold it to me was completely honest and he even made a note of what was missing or what he was able to tell that was missing. And that's why he had the model being offered for the $25 price range, which by the way, I must say is lower than typical market value for one of these kits. However, I figured that the model was still a risk. So I was able to negotiate it lower even from that point. And also it helps me in the deal that I purchased other models from him. So he did hook me up and paying cash too is another way to, you know, help grease the wheel, so to speak. Regardless, over here, it is missing some components and the components that are missing are the crew member, which is supplied with this model. Fortunately for me, that's not a problem because as we know, I don't build the crew members and they always end up languishing away in the Bastille, AKA the spare figure bin. So if anyone, by the way, is interested in pick in purchasing a lot of 135th scale figures that are unassembled or tank commanders, hit me up. I have a literal bin full of them that are just waiting for a home in a vehicle of some sort, but it's not gonna be with me. Regardless, it definitely has that old school Tamiya quality. We have here that really cool Tamiya badge on the runner. The only difference again is that originally we had molded in Japan right over here and then the date 1974, but on all the kits that were moved to the Philippines, that little verbiage was milled away as I've touched upon in a few other videos. Outside of that, you can see the other remaining components for the turret, as well as that bed frame antenna, which is an iconic bit of detailing on these vehicles. And I'm actually looking forward to building that because I, I would always see this vehicle as a kid in magazines and stuff. And, you know, finally, it's my turn at assembling one. We have the visor details right over there. They appear to be very nicely detailed. And again, this model here was tooled up in the mid-1970s. The grills right here on the back, a bit on the flatter side, but again, 1974 tooling. And, it, you know, it, by and large, I think it aged pretty well. That's basically it for this fellow over here. The next sprue contains, obviously, the parts for the suspension, which for an Achtenraden is very, very important. Here we have all of the wheels for the main suspension parts. And the wheels are a multi-part assembly where we have the faces, we have the back sections, and then we have the inner hub units which get secured to the suspension, which by the way, we have all of the suspension parts right there. The suspension on this one is molded to be very easily assembled. Of course, it is a Tamiya after all. And everything is a single drop-in assembly, which really streams down, streamlines down the uh, part count as well as also the complexity. We have all of the clevises and all that other good stuff found here, the leaf springs. Basically, like I said before, everything is mostly there. However, upon further examination, when I got the model home, I see it was missing something that even the vendor didn't catch when he was looking over the model. And that is what's in, or I should say what's missing in this area right here, as well as this area. And that is the spare tire. You see the spare tire was snipped away by whoever originally owned this model for, I guess, one project or another. And now that I have the model, I need to go ahead and find a replacement. Well, one of the reasons why I'm actually building this model at this time is because at the same time, I'm actually working on a Dragon Puma pattern of armored car. And with the way that kit is designed, you do have several 
wheels and components that are to be used. Well, the hubs are duplicates, so I could, you know, find one for the spare. And the only thing I need to do is just make a mold of the spare tire itself. I'm not sure, but I think it may work because the, the wheels on the older pattern Achtenraden and the later Pumas were, I believe, the exact same size. And if they were, I could simply just make a resting copy of the Dragon one, make some mods in order to secure it to this old Tamiya one. If that's not the case, I'm going to have to come up with another solution, but we'll see how that pans out as the build continues. Regardless, at the moment, I'm going to be relying on the Dragon one as a, not a donor, but definitely something to act as a clone, which is actually going to give you a better detailed tire compared to the older one. But regardless, that's the plan I have in mind. And I didn't even know that when I first looked at the model. I just, you know, looked at it, saw it was open, it was missing a couple parts, and I generally figured if missing one or two pieces, it might be missing more. But again, we'll touch more upon that later. Okay, so in here we have a loose little bucket running around, and we also have the decal sheet. Blue paper backing, typical to me of water slide decals. Needless to say, in the past I've had some good results with them. So we'll see how they adhere, and also how they get secured on with the the varnish that I generally use. Here's the note that the vendor put in his box over here. So I was able to see what was missing. And in addition to missing the crew member, it's also missing the instructions, which I will be touching upon momentarily. So continue on takes us to the final bag, which contains the last two runners. As you can clearly see, this one has also been snipped away and it's missing a couple components. After I did a little bit of homework at finding a pair of instructions, I was able to determine that what was snipped away here are some jerry cans and import, most importantly, the jerry can mounts. Again, I do have these components on hand, thanks in part due to the Dragon Puma model that I'm working on. A couple parts can easily be molded, and then I'll be able to cast some high quality replacements. Other than that, you get to see what the remainder of the components look like on the sprue. We have these really boxy fenders, which is an iconic bit of detailing for this pattern of vehicle. And another most iconic bit of detailing is this perforated extended bumper that we have here, which I always thought looked really, really cool. But yet again, I never had the opportunity to build one of these kits up until now. As in typical to me a fashion, the pieces are nicely molded, everything is clean, there's no real flash to report on, and the pieces should go together fairly easily in that respect. On this brew here, we are still missing some other components, which again, I believe are accessories for the commander or some of the other crewmen, thing like it was binoculars and a holster and things like that. But, you know, we'll see how that really fleshes out during the actual construction. But regardless, the remainder of the more important bits are there, such as the exhaust manifolds, the hatches, those little jars that are always on these German armored cars, all that is present. And those are actually some of the trickier things to fabricate. So those are at least are there. The guards are there, the headlights, and we have two options of headlights. I'm not sure if that's a thing or if the one's on a lower tier. Again, I don't really know so much about this vehicle, but we'll definitely, it'll be a learning experience for me as the build continues. Now, generally at this point here, I would take out the instructions and open them up and, sh and, be, and show, well, oh, look, the instructions look pretty cool. If there's a mistake, blah, blah, blah. However, obviously on this model here, that's not gonna be the case and the instructions are missing. Normally, I would be in the dark. However, fortunately on Scalemates, which is an excellent website, by the way, specifically if you wanna learn about the history of many of these kits and, you know, how they connect to one another. They have a section of downloadable instructions for a large number of kits. This one, fortunately included. So I was able to find the instruction manual and from there I have it as a PDF. I'm gonna print that bad boy out and then I'll be able to assemble the model with that in hand. It was also because of that PDF, I was able to basically piece together what was missing on this kit over here. And so far, it seems like I should be able to navigate through this build pretty easily. This is a bit different compared to, for instance, the vintage Tamiya Stug 3 I did a little while ago, where I was not able to find instructions and that build I was utterly in the dark and I was piecemealing the whole model together. Fortunately, that was a really easy build and I was able to happily report that I was able to get that model completely assembled with all the kit supply parts and it came out pretty well, or at least I think. 
So here's the model going through its course of construction. The model itself goes together pretty easily. It is a Timia after all. However, this one I ran into some quirks with specifically because again, it is a used kit and there were some other components missing besides the ones that were mentioned earlier in the video. This is a, one of those type of things that you're not really gonna find out until once you're actually in the build and you're hitting some certain points and like, oh, where's that piece on the trees? Oh, it's gone. So. Uh, when this happens, you know, this is tends to complicate the build quite a bit, but again, I have the resources, shall we say, to go ahead and correct that. So first and foremost, we're going to start here with the front bow section. One thing I do want to point out that's really cool is I love this bumper found on the Achtenraden. It's uh, really distinctive and it's really uh, a nice piece of detailing. This piece here is actually not yet glued on because of what's underneath. On the vehicle, we actually have provisions for mounting on some tools, and these are supplied with the Tamiya kit. It's one piece and just drops directly into place, giving you the detailing, huzzah, you're good to go. Fortunately, the bit of detailing is one of the components that we're missing, so I'm gonna have to go ahead and flush this area out with other means. So the first thing that I did was I went ahead and plugged up these holes here with some plastruct and also with a little bit of bodywork. The bodywork at this point has been wet sanded nice and flush, and at this one here, I'm actually ready to start fabrication of the actual tools themselves. The tools in question are a axe as well as a pickaxe. Fortunately, trying to fabricate new ones isn't gonna to be too difficult because this is why I always tell people never throw away their spare parts. I have the spares right here on hand. So both of these components here are from Dragon from some various builds I've done in the past. This one here is from a Yak Panther kit, but the runner itself was from a one of the Panther builds that I've done, and I mentioned that in the other video. But regardless, on this runner here, we have a really nice shovel that's rendered on. So this one here is just basically just gonna be cut and paste and mounted onto the model when the time comes. And the next one for the pickaxe, I have this run over here, which is from an, a Dragon American pattern vehicle. I believe it was one of the patents or maybe one of the M6 kits with the way that kit's designed when you use the 50 you or the M2, I should say, you, you know, get this basic runner over here with a bunch of MG parts on it. But regardless, we have this really cool pickaxe. The pickaxe is basically, by and large, exactly where it needs to be from what I can tell from looking at the online resources. Perhaps this, the handle is going to be shortened just a little bit, but one thing I do have to fabricate on this are the straps actually secure it to the mounts that are going to be fabricated onto the front. On the front here of the vehicle, there are these two straps that are welded on the front and these have the provisions for the tool clamps that the tools obviously strap to. So this is something I'm going to have to fabricate and do a little bit of working with with some strip of aluminum. Aside from the tool post, another bit of equipment that's missing involves the tin work. And that is, uh, I believe it might be this one over here. There's a jack that would have been mounted in this location as what you commonly see on most German AFV. Well, the jack is indeed missing, but fortunately again, thanks to spare parts and dragon kits giving you such a liberal amount of components, I have here some ways to fix it. So I have two options of jacks that are found on these sprues. I just got to figure out which one is going to be appropriate for this pattern of vehicle, as I believe this jack here might be too heavy. This is the type of jack you'll find on a heavy tank, like a Tiger or a Panther, something like that. Uh, this jack here may be the one to go for in Achtenraden, so that's probably the one I'm going to be rolling with. Uh, I have another run here with some other German armor car parts, but I think I have enough components here to pull the job off. Just like with the pickaxe, with this jack over here, it doesn't have the tool posts or the straps integrally molded on, so this is going to be something I'm going to have to fabricate. But again, eh, just a little bit of aluminum work, not like it's anything I haven't done in the past. One other thing I also want to mention at this time involves the most iconic bit on this entire build, and that's the bed frame antenna, which is located right over here on top of the vehicle. This is, again, probably one of the coolest bits of detailing on the entire piece, and it's one, definitely one of the features that stood out to me all these years. However, you'll notice that this is going to require some intricate layering in terms of when the part gets fitted and painted because of with the way it's designed. This is the type of thing where once it gets put in place, you can't remove it, and the turret has to be mounted onto the model before this piece gets fitted in place. So, needs to say, this is going to be probably the very last thing that's going to get mounted to this model at some point. However, just because the bed frame itself gets mounted at the very end, that doesn't mean I can't have the post mounted onto the model. And this is going to be installed first, but after all of the revision work is completed. So we'll 
circle around and mention that as the video goes on. Also, while working on the build, one thing that I did want to mention at this time is involving the sirens that we have here. On the tin work, there are two sirens that are present, and both are supplied with the kit, and are present even on this example that we have here, which is a good thing. The siren themselves is a product of the 1970s, or I should say 1970s tooling. It does have the overall look and shape of the siren. However, the piece is molded solid. Here we have the sprue right here, and you can see how it's rendered on. The sprue attachment point is right there on the opening, which needless to say makes for a nice solid type piece. Again, this is something that would be commonplace on models from this era being the mid 1970s, but this is something that can potentially hurt the look of the build, but it is something that I went ahead and addressed, and you can see it right here on this example in front of you. As for how I exactly do that, well, I'm going to go ahead and take you all along and show you exactly how this little modification is done. The first thing you need to do in order to improve the siren is to first remove it off of the sprue. Easily enough done with a pair of clean cut snips. Then the next thing you want to do is to square it off. The front section where that nub was remaining was filed away with a needle file. Does pretty short work of it. And then the remainder of the work involves just cleaning up the outside. The parts on the outside that need to be refined are locations where the two halves of the mold connected. And you do have, I don't want to say it's flash, it's just a small little seam line that runs across these areas here, and it's something that sticks out of the plastic. Again, very commonplace on a lot of these older tooling kits, and easily remedied with just a small sharp exacto like I have here. Once that is polished away, it's then time to start hollowing out the center portion. Okay, so with the camera off the tripod, the next thing I'm going to do is to do the remainder of the work here on the lathe. So here you have the component mounted in the jaws of my chuck over here. And the first thing I'm going to do in order to hollow it out is I need to drill a pilot hole. The pilot hole is going to be done with the tailstock right here. And in the tailstock, in the Jacobs chuck, I have a small little micro dremel bit. This dremel bit is the same size that I've touched upon in many of my other videos, and the vendor of this of these bits can be found in the video description listed below. Now, the bit is going to be used just to drill out a pilot hole in the center of this piece here, and the pilot hole is going to be important because this is going to help align the next tool that I'm going to use in order to add the funnel flare to the actual piece itself. Obviously, this is a siren, it's a horn-shaped object, so a straight cylindrical hole is not really going to be the best. But if you do not have the following tooling on hand, yeah, you know, the hole is better than nothing. In that case, just drill the hole in the center with a pin vise and call it a day. But, you know, we're going to go on the more exotic end with this one over here, and I'm going to show exactly how I do that with the lathe. But again, first thing I'm going to do is drill the hole. So with the camera placed back onto the tripod, here I have the component ready for the next step, which is to drill the pilot hole. In order to drill the hole, obviously I'm using the tailstock like I just touched upon, but the amount of material that needs to be removed is noteworthy. You don't want to remove everything. You don't want to hollow it out through and through. It's not really relevant for this build. You only need to remove maybe about two millimeters or about an eighth of an inch of material at most. So just a little bit in is really all that's going to be required in order to remove the necessary amount of material for the next step. So might as well get on video. It may be tricky to get on camera, but the hole has been drilled out and there's nothing really shows, just a cylindrical straight wall hole. The next thing I need to do is to add the curvature. In order to do that, I'm going to go ahead and utilize my needle file. This is just a standard round needle file. They're standard in every one of those needle file sets. This one here is from Harbor Freight, so they're really easily come by. And obviously, a set of needle files should be a mandatory bit of equipment in your modeling toolbox. If you don't have one, I recommend picking up a set. Anyway, so, the needle file is perfect because since it is cylindrical and is conical in shape, obviously when the the headstock is spinning, it's going to remove the material only in the sections where it's making contact with it, and since it is a funnel-shaped object, it's going to give you the natural funnel-shaped cut that's required for this piece. This is something you do want to take your time with. You want to be careful if you over sand too much or you go too fast, the plastic will heat, overheat up and melt. And if that happens, it's going to cause some problems and things will go sideways really quick. So you want to use your best judgment and take your time. A little bit goes a long way with a procedure like this.
that's really all there is to it. The procedure goes by pretty, pretty quick. And if anything, it took longer to film all of this than it was to actually do the job itself. So once I take the piece out of the, the headstock over here, you can see the funnel section now cut into place. Nothing more to do except for mount it onto the tin work. And after about an hour or so of fiddling around with some aluminum, you can see what the model looks like with those new straps and tools added in place. So first I'll start with the tin work here. Here you can see the jack mounts that have been fabricated. The original holes have been plugged up with a little bit of bodywork and then blended over. And this allowed me the perfect surface to add the new jack mounts to these locations. These are all fabricated out of thin strips of just soda can aluminum that were cut to shape and then bent with the plier and then secured in place. The jack itself I have over here in the box. Here's the dragon jack and just basically just going to drop directly into place like that after everything is painted. And then two other straps are going to be secured to the top giving it for the top mounting detailing. As you can see, it does quite a bit to polish up this section over here and really improves it from the kit original. From these now brings us to the other bit of aluminum work that I was mentioning before, which is the front tool rack. As you can see, all of the tools have been fitted. I used the dragon components that I touched upon before that were in the previous scene. However, for this model here, I'm going to do something a little bit different. Normally on my models, the tools are literally the last thing that gets fitted to the build. This is done so that I can paint them off the model, I can weather them off the model, and it just makes things a lot easier by and large. You don't have to worry about any paint slips or any other thing that could harm the finish. It's all done off the model, then when the time comes, boom, I drop them in place, the model gets varnished, and it's good to go. However, for this one here, that's not going to be an option because this one I actually had to fabricate the tool posts and mounts themselves and obviously I can't exactly do this with the parts off the model so for this one here I'm I went ahead and mounted the tools on at this time which means when it comes time for painting and weathering I'm gonna have to be very careful with my painting techniques in order to go ahead and properly get paint on these locations here without causing any collateral damage I should be able to pull this off it just takes a little bit of skill and technique and not to mention a fine paintbrush and also an equally fine and steady hand, but I think I should manage, you know, judging how I was able to do some other builds in the past. But as you can see, the front is now fully flushed out and it looks much better compared to the way we had it before. Also, it's important to point out that if you are working on one of these models, that bumper section really needs to be installed really after the model is fully painted and weathered because obviously trying to get the tools fitted in place as well as also painted like the way I have to do on this one uh, yeah it's gonna be a bit of a problem trying to pull this off with this component fitted in in this area so this is probably gonna be one of the last things that gets fitted to the model obviously it's gonna be painted and weathered beforehand while on the topic of paint and weathering this now leads us to the paintwork or I should say the pre paintwork so this model here being an Octoraden is no different than the Puma or any of the other eight wheeled German armored cars where you really want to go ahead and pre-paint these sections here prior to the actual model heading off into paint and the reason why I say that is well quite clearly noted there's a lot of detailing going on down here which means a lot of extremities lots of nooks lots of crannies lots of areas for paint not to get into and once the tin work goes on it just makes getting access to these areas all that much more difficult and it's one of those weird things where although it's hard to get paint into these locations you will still be able to see bare exposed plastic if you're just viewing the model so in order to mitigate this what i'm going to do is at this point here i'm actually going to prime the model and also get these areas here with their base coat. Once the base coat dries, I can then commence with the remainder of the assembly, which would include not only the tin work, but also a lot more of the guards and other bits of detailing that are found on the bottom portion of the, the suspension. The components that are noteworthy to point out are the little guard that we have right here that goes on the center portion here of the frame, protects the transmission, as well as the front and rear guards. And oop, last but certainly not least, the drive shaft guard that we have right here. So these are all going to be pre-primed, painted with their base coat, and then I could start the final assembly, to which once that's complete, the whole model can head off into paint at that time. 
So basically, if you're watching this video, the main takeaway is sequence. If you're doing a build like this, sequence is going to be the most important thing to consider. And that's not just true for the Achtenraden, like this one over here, but it's also true, again, for other vehicles with a similar type setup. Vehicles like the Puma, uh, the LAV25 is another one that may or may not be similar in this regard, and even such vehicles as the Striker. If you have a vehicle that's an wheeled armor car with a lot of appendages down here on the bottom, the German Luchas is another one that just quickly came to mind, uh, you're going to want to more likely exhibit a procedure like this just to ensure that the model is thoroughly painted. Trust me, you will have gaps, if not, and you will see them, which will hurt the look of the build. There's no way around it. So paint everything sequentially and then your build in the long run will definitely look better. And here's the new replacement spare tire, fully completed, and it's actually ready for paint and then eventually mounting to the model. As I touched upon before, this piece was missing on the actual kit component, so a new one had to have been scrounged. And just like I touched upon before, in order to do this, I had to make a mold or a copy of one of the wheels that are supplied with the kit. However, making the wheel copy is pretty much straightforward enough. However, you are going to have to do some extra tweaks to it in order to make it fit for a spare tire roll as opposed to the standard fitted type roll that is found on the kit component. What I mean by that is if you look at the center portion of the hub, on the way the kit one is we have the lug nuts as also the hub cap and even the inner drub detailing integrally molded into the plastic part. For the purposes of fitting to the model, it's actually perfect. However, for the spare tire, you're going to need to do a little bit of extra work. So the biggest part of the conversion was to go ahead and remove and amputate some of the original detailing in order to make the wheel into the spare tire roll that we have presently. So the original tire itself was molded and this here is made from my standard cast resin. It is a two-piece assembly just like it was on the original where we have the inner donut on the inside as well as the outer rim. However, the outer portion on the hub face section does have those details I just mentioned. In order to to delete them, I had to do this in a very careful manner. First, the center hole, or I should say the center hub cap was drilled out on the drill press. Fortunately, with the way the kit is designed, there is that molded in peg on the inside that's an alignment for that little rotating disc. But that point was actually the perfect location to self-center the, dr the drill bit when it came time for drilling it out. Once I had the pilot hole drilled out with a round needle file, I was able to carefully just polish down the remaining areas around the circumference over here, where once that was removed, the shards just fell away, and I had the hole presently to the way you see it here. For the lug nuts, the original ones were just snipped away with a very sharp exacto, and then with a pin vise I carefully drilled out the locations where they once previously stood. The hardest part was actually drilling out the open sections there around the spokes. This was done with a Dremel with a really small Dremel bit and was done at a very slow speed, and I was able to carefully hog out the material to the way you see it here. Fortunately, I was able to do this in one go, and I didn't have any mishaps during the procedure. The other thing that needs to be noteworthy is with the interior. With the way the original Tamiya kit is designed, there is a little disc that gets sandwiched in between the outer section of the wheel and also the inner donut. And this is a nice little bit of detailing because it allows the wheel to be permanently mounted to the model, but allows it to freely rotate, which I'll be touching upon as the video progresses. However, one side effect that this has and where it's relevant for this is because there is a little recess found in this area over here on the inner portion for the thing to actually lock in place and rotate. With that bit of detailing not present because it's a spare, I do have now a valley that needs to be plugged up. In order to do that, I simply took a PVC tube and I turned it on the lathe so that I was able to remove just the right amount of material for the, the tube to be transformed into a sleeve so it slips in inside of the wheel, but the tube itself is thin enough where it doesn't cause any problems where it's visually an eyesore. So it's really the best solution for the situation at hand. Why it's also really relevant to mention this is because with the way the wheel gets fitted to the model, you are going to be seeing this portion which is going to be exposed to the viewer as opposed to this area here where it needs to basically plug onto the kit supply component. So focusing on the inner detailing area here is actually very, very relevant for the 
model at hand. However, as you can see, it's now fully completed. And at this point here, it's gonna head off into paint, weathering, and then mounting to the model. So with the model now fully completed, let's go ahead and start with the suspension. But because this is an armored car, and because I touched upon it before, we might as well start with the lower suspension area. So as I touched upon earlier, the undercarriage is just filled with small little appendages and just little crevasses that prevent paint from getting into their proper locations. Which is why I touched upon before to paint the sections with several of the components off because it makes getting paint on these areas much more easily done. And here you get to see the actual end result of that. These sections here are all thoroughly painted no matter which angle I hold the model. There's going to be not just the primer coat but also the base coat on those various sections. And as for the remainder of the weathering, well this was done with the same format that I'm going to touch upon for the remainder of the build as I get to the paint and weathering portion of the video. Regardless, the undercarriage here painted very well and I'm really happy in how everything turned out on the underside. The shields have been fitted in place for both the drive shaft shrouds as well as the front and rear armor sections and also the front, or I should say the mid transmission section over here was all painted and then secured in place. Because the Tamiya kit is what it is, all these components just dropped into their appropriate locations once the paintwork was concluded. One other thing I want to mention about the suspension before I flip the model over is with the drive shaft protective boot that we have right over here. With the way the vehicle is, you have this little rubber boot that protects the drive shaft when it emerges from the differential. This detailing is integrally molded into the Tamiya kit and it's actually decently rendered out of the box. It's a little tricky to get with the lighting, however, I have a flashlight over here, so hopefully this should put things into better light, figuratively and literally. So here you get to see the piece right over here. This piece is found duplicate on all eight of the row wheels, and the piece, geometrically speaking, is actually quite excellent. The only thing you gotta do as a builder is with a little swipe of, to me, a bl flat black, or in my case, rubber black, was to just paint the little sections carefully with a paintbrush. This is really all that's required in order to spice up the model, and it's always something that looks great when you do these these armor cars. If we can recall, a similar technique was done to the Dragon Achtenraden that I did a little while ago for basically the exact same reasons. With the model flipped right side up, this brings us to the remainder of the run gear, which in this case are the wheels. The wheels on this model over here are really cool in that they are designed to be functional. And by just building the model out of the box, you can have the model have a nice little roll to it, which is something that some builders out there might deem to be a great feature because some people like to still play with their models. This one here is actually, yeah, you can go ahead and do that without necessarily causing too much damage. You know, it's much easier, say, compared to a tank with, you know, some type of a track system. But for this one here, yeah, it actually rolls really, really well. If I move the little table out of the way, it has an excellent roll to it. So if that's something that you're looking for, this is definitely going to be the kit for you. Uh, outside of that, the other thing I do want to mention is that if you are building this model, this model is intended to be depicted with the wheels in the straight manner. So if you are one of those people out there that like to have your armored cars or your wheeled vehicles with the wheels tilted to one side or the other, this is something that cannot be done with this build outside of doing some heavy, heavy scratch building and modification of the kit components. Is it something that can be done? Theoretically, however, it is going to require quite a bit of scratch building in order to do so. So much so that it's really something that is more or less off the table. With the camera brought in closer, you get to see the quality on the actual detailing on the wheels themselves. And the wheel detailing is really good. The lug nut detailing is all present, as are the hub detailing. And the thread pattern also is something that came out to be very nicely molded on this older kit that we have here. Moving our way to the back takes to the spare tire, and as I mentioned before, this is a new cast resin replacement component, as the original one was missing with the model. And also, as I mentioned before, I had to make some modifications to the stock unit in order to transform it from a mounted wheel to a spare wheel. And now that the model is fully painted and completed, with the tire fitted in place, it definitely blends in with the remainder of the detailing without batting an eye. Once those modifications were made, the unit just gets fitted into place as the kit one originally would have. Outside of the tire, the remainder of the components are stock with the model, went on without any sort of problems. One thing I do want to reference though are the tail and convoy light. On this side over here we have the round version and the paintwork is what you'll see on many other builds on this channel, where the top section is painted red while the bottom one is in orange, and this is again as per real examples that I was researching. As for the blackout light, this is the typical German AFV square pattern of 
black outline, and the kit piece is molded in the following format, where we have the flip-up section clipped to the top with the square little lenses being exposed. The squares are painted in green as they are found on the real examples. Some other details to mention are the exhaust manifolds. These again are the kit ones. However, I did went ahead and drill them out with a pin vise, which is a customary bit of detail I like to do on these builds. And it's always one that helps the look of the model compared to leaving it with the section molded solid. Just like I mentioned on MGs, if you do not have the tooling or the skill set in order to hollow those out, perhaps this is something you might want to pump your brakes on and avoid because if you screw this up, this is something that can actually hurt the look of the model. And let's just say if you try the technique and you botch it up, well, it's not a total loss because what you can do is you can actually drill out the entire section and replace the molded in nub with a small plastic or a metal tube. This is something that will also help the look of the model, but again, it only should be done for someone that has the skill sets and the technique in order to do that. If you do not have the tools or the skill sets, you just might want to just roll with the unit left in its stock configuration. Also in this section over here, you get to see the rear headlights. And yes, these are headlights, even though this is technically the rear of the vehicle. As I touched upon before, this pattern of vehicle is very unique because it had dual driver sections. And for the unit to technically back up, the rear driver has a dedicated set of headlights just in case they need to do so in a low light or a nighttime type setting. These again are the kit components and were simply just painted as such. The units have their blackout details integrally molded on, so just a little swipe of silver paint was all that was required to give you the lens detailing. Moving backward takes to the siren. As I touched upon before, I did hollow these sections out and it does give a little bit of extra detailing, which you can see here. One thing I also love about these German armored cars, and same is true with the half tracks or with the indicator little beacons that we have on either side. These are not lights, they are just simply metal rods with little balls found on the end just to let the driver know exactly where the fenders are on the vehicle. On this model here, and this is also true for many other vehicles that have this type of detailing, I went ahead and painted the round sections in white as this was commonly seen on the real vehicles in the field. This is something that when done always really helps to look at the model and just makes it have that much more extra color pop to it. It never ceases to enhance the build. Moving on, the remainder of the tin work takes us to the fire extinguisher, which is the kit original, but we also have here the shovel. The shovel is relevant to point out because this is not the original one that was supplied with the model, and the reason why is because, just like with the other tools, it was just missing from this example that I was building. The one that we have here is a dragon component, and again came from one of those spare runners that I mentioned earlier in the video. Just like with the front tool where they didn't have the tool post, that was also true for this one over here. So the tool posts you see on this model were scratch built out of thin strips of aluminum, much along the same lines as I touched upon with the other sections. Once everything was painted, weathered, it was just mounted to the location where the kit one would have been fitted originally. Moving towards the front takes to the jack. As I mentioned before, this detailing was all added because the kit one was absent. And now that the model's fully complete, you really get to see what the final outcome looks like. Overall, this really did help the build by utilizing this version here as opposed to trying to stick with the original one. So in the end, the piece being missing, as well as with the other tools, was more or less a happy accident. Regardless, now that you see what it looks like fitted in place, you can see why I went ahead and painted everything separately because trying to get in here to paint this little bit of tooling as well as with the remainder of the vehicle is definitely something that would have been very hard, if not impossible to do. So that's why I always paint my tools separately after the vehicle is painted and weathered. The top sections, are two little strips of aluminum. As I mentioned before, after the unit was painted and weathered and installed in place, they were simply just added to the corresponding locations, thus completing the detailing. Also, carrying on, takes us to the little side around the front. Again, hollowed out, improving the look compared to the other version. Flipping to the opposite side, nothing really much here to discuss. All the detailing that you see on these sections over here are stock with the Tamiya kit and were simply utilized without any sort of problems. And this brings us to the front area. So first I want to mention is the jerry cans. As I mentioned before, the kit originally had some jerry cans, which would have been located in these sections over here. However, the kit ones were absent. And earlier on in the video, I said that I might replace, or I was going to replace them with the versions from Dragon, which I had left over from the other Aknraden kit that I mentioned before. Well, Fortunately for this build here, those other spare parts which I had on hand just weren't necessary because this kit gives you an option on how to depict it either with the use of the jerry cans or with the use of the little 
toolbox type details and also these little jars that we have here on the front. So obviously for this build here, I just simply just kept the stock tooling versions rather than trying to use the the extra jerry cans, which will more likely be saved and used for another build that comes down the road. But for this one here, it was, again, it, I'm kind of glad the way things worked out the way they did. As for these components, again, they just went into the appropriate locations without any sort of complications. And as for the jars, I went ahead and painted them in the following format, where they were painted with a darker shade of olive drab. Or, no, olive drab. I'm sorry, that's a Freudian slip. Uh, painted with a darker shade of Panzer Grey, and the shade is, is is a bit darker compared to the remainder of the paintwork found on the remainder of the vehicle. And this is done to give some differentiation and also some extra color pop. In addition to that, you can see the little straps, which are a grun or dunkelgrun type material. And this is something that would be found on a lot of German webbing that would be found on these vehicles from the era. Again, by doing this, this greatly helps the color of the model and gives it just a little bit of extra intrigue as opposed to just painting everything, you know, in a monocolor type format. As I mentioned before, also, the headlights are right over there on the front and they're painted in the exact same format. And this leads us to the bumper. As I touched upon before, the bumper is definitely one of my more favorite attributes found on this vehicle. This along with the bed frame antenna on the roof, which I'll be talking about in a minute. These are something that are just seared in my mind on what this vehicle is. It's such a key feature of detailing and clearly I fitted it to this vehicle. I believe this is an optional bit of equipment. But again, to pass this up, you got to really have your head examined because it just looks so cool on the front. The piece goes together very well. I love how Tamiya rendered out the holes found in this section over here. They're not solid or anything like that. They are hollow through and through. And this is, again, a very nice bit of tooling. It goes together pretty well. Just take your time. Make sure that the alignment is all correct on the parts, that they're all squared away. And that's really all you have to pay attention to when installing this component. As I also mentioned earlier, the component was fitted after the tool work was thoroughly painted. And here you get to see what the final outcome of those tools are. As I mentioned before, the tools on this particular example had to have been mounted to the model before the paintwork, which is definitely something that I don't generally do for the reasons that I already mentioned. But as you can see, I was super careful with my paintwork and I was able to carefully paint around all of the little bits of detailing in order to have the effects that you see here. So in the end, it actually worked out very well. However, this is only for a emergency situation. If this was the original kit tooling part, this is something that would still be painted separately and then mounted at the end of the build. However, with these pieces here, it really does flesh out the front very well and the extra color pop from the tool handle is definitely something that I appreciate. Moving up takes to the bow hatches. Nothing really much to talk about here. These ones here are integrally molded on. They look pretty good. And this takes us to the visor sections. The visors are separate bits of equipment that get glued in place. However, they are decently rendered. You just have to carefully move them off the sprue, deburr them, and then they should just drop into the appropriate locations that you see here. One thing that I do want to point out is you got to be careful on the amount of glues that you use on these sections over here. They are very frail, and if you have just a little bit too much glue, this might puddle up and cause some problems, and this is something that's best left to avoid. On these pieces here, I believe I use a very small finite amount of the thick super glue just to mount the pieces in place, and then with a small drip of the thin super glue, I just applied it to the rain guard or the rain gutter sections, and it just seeped into all of the areas hardening in place, keeping them where they need to be, but it's not too thick where it plugs up any sort of detailing or even a little seam work where these sections make contact with the body. This was done to not just the ones on the front, but also the ones on the rear. You take your, if you're careful with this, the pieces should come out just fine. Same is also true for the ones right here on the back. Again, as for the remainder of these hatches and engine hatch detailing, these are all stock molded onto the model. Nothing really much to discuss there. And this takes us to the side section detailing here. And this is something that looks also really, really cool on these vehicles. So we have the turn signal, which is actually a little arrow that flips up whenever you want to indicate if you're making a left or a right hand turn. And we also have two sets of lights found in these sections over here again, one for the front, one for the back. But the coolest part is definitely the brush guard. The brush guards just look awesome on this vehicle over here. And it's just a nice little bit of detailing that's found in this mid area. These components here are all stocked with the Tamiya kit and were just simply mounted as per the 
kit's instructions, and they went on by and large pretty easily. However, one thing that I do want to mention is that you want to make sure you take your time with the installation of all these components. They are on the smaller side and also with the way the geometry is with the vehicle, this may lead to some complications on just getting them fitted in a square manner. So you want to install the turn signal and the lights first, let the glues fully set and dry, and then from there, you can install the brush guard. And again, just be careful with the alignment of with the way they fit on the hull. Once they are fitted in place and let the glues dry, the piece then is pretty much easily said and done. Moving briefly back to the rear section takes to this rear grille here. Very nice bit of detailing. I like the way the louvers are rendered out and they just look great when you apply the Tamiya panel line accent, which is something I'll be touching upon again when I get to the paintwork on this vehicle. The other thing I want to mention that was actually something that gave a little bit of a surprising slight complication was the spare tire rack. This is something that just gets fitted in place. However, for some reason, it just doesn't really fit on all that snug. It fits on good, just not very snug. It's one of those things where you'll glue it in place and then you'll always seem to bump it, or at least that was my experience with this build over here. So this is one of those things you want to take your time with again. Make sure the glues are properly set on this before you continue with other aspects of the build. Moving upward takes to the turret, and the turret on this model here is again very easily assembled. The one thing that I did want to mention is with the mantlet section. The mantlet is a little bit of tooling that fits into these little recessed little hinge points, and then the whole front plate gets mounted to the turret itself. This is something that obviously can't easily be done, but is one of those things you want to take your time with and use a very careful amount of glue, because if the glues are too much, you're going to glue the mantlet in place and you're not going to really solve any problems. So that's the one thing I just want to mention with that to watch out for. The other thing I want to mention is with the armament themselves, you'll see that I went ahead and drilled these sections out. I did it to the main one and also to the coax MG. And again, I always mention this, this is something that always helps to look at the build, but you got to be careful when you're doing this if you don't have the skill sets like I touched upon with the exhaust, you just might want to you know, leave that and just continue the build as is. As for the paintwork, I'm jumping briefly ahead, you notice that they are not painted with the same color of the vehicle. Obviously the MG34 would be a blued or a parkerized type coloring, but the same is also true for the main armament. This is not painted with the same color as the remainder of the vehicle, or at least from the various examples that I was doing for research. The remainder of the tar details are very simple and they go on to their appropriate locations, such as the hatches and the visors and things like that. You want to just be careful with the visors. They are a bit on the smaller side and if you are working a little too fast or a little clumsy, you have the potential on accidentally dropping and losing one. And if you do, you're going to be in trouble because they don't give you any spares. So that's the only thing I want to say about, you know, pumping your brakes on. The next thing involves the turret is with how it fits to the vehicle and how that portrays to the bed frame antenna. And this leads us to one of the more fascinating parts that I always found on this vehicle and as a kid was one of those things that always like stumped me was how were they able to secure this big bed frame antenna onto the turret and yet still have the turret be able to rotate. And the Tamiya kit here is actually done more or less true to form to the real one. So the way the bed frame antenna is, it's actually fitted to the rear section. This is the area where the unit is firmly attached to the hull. And all these components here are again stock with the model and they install on in a very easily done manner. The only thing you do want to watch out with though is the alignment. So these pieces do plug into the appropriate locations and they do have the right angles onto them. However, you want to be very careful with the actual alignment when you install the bed frame section, just so that these pieces are spaced evenly. This is something that you can easily make the mistake where the part can potentially be listening to one side or the other. And if you're doing this, you want to make sure everything is squared away. Something, it doesn't really require any tools. Just use your eye and, you know, adjust accordingly. But once you have that fitted in place, this is where the, the frame actually needs to be glued more securely compared to the remainder sections. Which leads us to the front portion, and that's because the antenna is not glued on to anything in the front area. It just rests on the little frame that we have here on top of the turret. Fortunately, the way the kit is designed, it's really more or less foolproof in how everything fits together. But this is, again, the thing you have to watch out with is with the assembly method. So as I mentioned before, the model when it's being built and painted, the frame is literally the last thing that gets secured to the build and it's one of the last bits of details that get mounted in place. This is because you need to paint everything 
and you can't exactly take the turret off with this bed frame in place. And me, I like to paint my models with the turrets off just so that the bottom portion is thoroughly painted. And this means that when you rotate the turret, you're gonna have no exposed areas of plastic left underneath, which you will have if you build and paint everything with the turret in place. Also with the bed frame fitted in place, this does make the manipulation and rotation of the turret a little bit trickier compared to some other models that are out there. But obviously it's something that can still be done. However, it is a bit more frail compared to basically any other vehicle with a turret. And more or less, this is one of those things you just want to set it and forget it. Because if one of these things breaks, eh, your life is going to be a little bit more difficult now. But, you know, the kit, to its credit, it's still nicely designed where everything lines up appropriately. The tar can still rotate. And the piece is more or less, you know, idiot-proof by and large. So the other thing I want to mention is with the bed frame, it's actually comprised of two components. We have the main frame here, and then there's this other cruciform section that gets secured into this location here. Everything is just nicely engineered so it goes into place without any sort of tweaks or modifications. The only other thing I want to mention about the frame itself is that there is a small little uh, mold line and it's like very, very minute. However, it's just one that when I had the opportunity, I quickly just polished away with a needle file and some sandpaper and you know, that leads for the result that we have here. However, this is something that's more or less optional, but I just wanted to mention it because you know, why not? The other thing is how it f secures to the roof. And like I stated before, it has always boggled me as a kid how they were able to do it. And with the way the piece is, there is a peg that emerges from this frame and it mounts onto this little receptacle hole that's found right here in the center portion of the bed frame. Like I mentioned before, it's not glued in place, so it just spins freely in this section here. The tolerances were actually pretty good. However, I slightly opened them up just a little bit more, just so this allowed the piece to freely rotate with, with more ease, specifically after everything was painted, weathered, and you know, you have those extra layers built up. With those extra layers built up, this may cause a little bit more friction, and for something like this, you wanna have it as friction-free as possible because, you know, for obvious reasons, when you're trying to rotate the turret less, you want it to stick and then potentially break. So this is something that I just used a round needle file, and I just opened the, the uh, tolerances up very slightly. So much so that, again, it was just like maybe a pass or two was all that was required, and the piece just dropped on in place without any sort of problems. And as I mentioned before, you can see how it rotates nice and fluidly without any sort of interaction or complications with the bed frame. And that's all there is to the detailing. And this leads us to the paint and the markings. For the most paint work, I wanted to do this one a bit differently compared to the other Panzer Grey vehicles that have been seen on this channel before. So for this one, I really wanted to make it emulate the box art as much as possible. I just love that 1970s box art, like I mentioned before, and I always wanted to try to get the colors to closely match this one as possible. So for this one, the paints are a little bit different. Normally I utilize, you know, my exterior latex and I add washes and other things on top of that. But for this one here, I went more old school to Mia. So first, the model was, of course, spray painted in flat black for the primer, as I always do, and even, it doesn't matter what paints I'm using, the black spray paint is my go-to choice for the use of a primer, for reasons I've touched upon in many of my videos. But after that, for the base coat, I went with just the Tamiya Acrylic Panzer Gray. Obviously, for this subject matter here, it's more than appropriate. And after the Panzer Gray was added, I went ahead and added several other washes to it. I lightened it up with one sort of wash, and then I added a blue filter to it. And the filter I used was Tamiya Flat Blue or Light, I think it was, yeah, Light Blue. Tamiya Light Blue, I watered that, out, that down in the airbrush, and I just airbrushed a nice little filter over everything, giving it for this blue, hue tint that we have here and honestly it came out absolutely perfect it looks very similar to the box art that i was aiming for and it's definitely one that looks very different compared to the other all panzer gray vehicles that i have in my collection which again it's always good to have vehicles with different shades and hues even if they are the same type of color just breaks up the monotony of your collection it always is good to have differentiation Outside of the filter, the remainder of the weathering work was done in my usual format with the use of the airbrush for the counter shading and also the use of dry brushing for the remainder of the weathering work that are present on all of my builds. The rubber tires have a little ring of flat white airbrushed on the sides to give that worn type effect, again, that is quite typically seen on my builds. And also the 
model was heavily used with the Tamiya panel line accent. It just really was beneficial on this model over here, just for all the small little nooks and crannies that are present on this vehicle, and there are many of them. First and foremost, the undercarriage here, need not say anymore, is just filled with small little recesses and things where that, that accent color just goes in and just makes it look all that much more better. The rims look great with that extra little wash on them. And then the grill work, like on the louvers here and the gutters, all of that was greatly enhanced with the use of the Tamiya panel line accent. It just came out absolutely perfect. And of course, once the weathering was applied, it was then time to mount on the decals. And the decals are just a standard Tamiya water slide decals, and they went on problem-free. The decals were in excellent quality, even though the condition of the kit was, you know, far from being perfect. And the decals on these Tamiya kits are generally always something of very good stock. And the ones here were no exception. They went on to the model without any sort of problems. And they were able to be secured and flattened to the surface with the VMS matte varnish to the condition that we have here. And the decals just came out absolutely perfect. Well, needless to say, in the end, I couldn't be any happier in how this build turned out. This was one of those kits that I always wanted to add to my collection, and finally having one represented in my collection, it definitely fills a void that has been left open for far too long. On top of that, as we saw earlier in the video, this model was missing some key detail fittings in order to fully flesh it out to the built status that we have here. So having undergone the procedures in order to go ahead and do that, it definitely feels very rewarding with the final outcome that we have here. And this is actually a perfect time to swing us into skill level and recommendation. If you are a beginner builder, one of these Tamiya Aktenraden kits here is actually something that can theoretically be built. These old school Tamiya models are just the gold standard in terms of simplicity as well as also detail fidelity, how they're able to balance those two. And a beginner here who really hasn't built a whole lot of models can definitely tackle one of these and more or less have some pretty decent results. However, the one bit of advice that I would give to a beginner who's trying to build one of these models is to take your time and to pace yourself. Although the suspension components are fairly straightforward with their construction, they can be, to a beginner specifically, a bit daunting just due to all the number of smaller parts that are found on the sprues. On top of that, you do have several frail or somewhat frail bits of equipment like the bed frame antenna as well as those two cool brush guards on the side things like this you definitely want to take your time with and make sure that you know you don't rush through this because this could potentially lead to issues namely with parts getting broken or potentially over snipped you know these are things that a beginner can have the propensity on on making these mistakes with if you go ahead though and take your time and carefully work around the aspects I just mentioned yeah this build here could definitely be built by someone with that type of a skill set and as one would imagine if this model here can be built by a beginner it can also be tackled by anyone who's an intermediate to an advanced range builder an intermediate builder can definitely have a blast with building one of these models over here it's a little bit more complicated compared to how it looks. However, it does assemble very easy and mostly effortlessly. And if you are an intermediate builder, those other hazards that I mentioned before are definitely something that you know how to tackle and to wade through. Someone who may be an advanced builder, however, may not necessarily be recommended this kit for the simple fact that one, if you're an advanced builder, chances are, and if you're a certain vintage, I should say, with your age, you've already built one of these in the past at some point. So you probably already have one in your collection or uh, put a firecracker in it eons ago. Uh, or chances are really good. You are going to be looking for something that has a little bit better detail fidelity and something with a little bit more complexity. And if that's you, perhaps this might not necessarily be the kit that you're looking for. If you are looking for this pattern of vehicle but are looking for something that has just that much better detail kit components I would recommend steering clear from this one and heading more towards something with more modern tooling like the version of this kit from AFV Club. However on the topic of the advanced range builder there are some aftermarket components that are out there in order to spruce this kit up and really polish it up to the best of the tooling that you're going to have here. There are some photo etch sets from Edward, and I'm pretty sure there may be some cast resin or even 3D printed sets out there that can further add to the detailing on this model over here. However, is it worth it? Again, this is best left up to the discretion of the builder. And I guess that's the perfect point to lead us into recommendations. First and foremost, if you're just a fan of World War II German armor, the Aktenraden over here definitely should be having a place in your collection. 
On top of that, if anyone's just a fan of armored cars in general, again, this vehicle here should fit into a collection for reasons that should be fairly obvious. Another person who I could see would really enjoy this kit here would be anyone who's into early war pattern of military vehicles. So if you're into the Blitz or North Africa or anywhere in that time range, the Oxenraden over here was a vehicle that was used quite extensively during those following campaigns. Another person who I'd recommend this kit to would be anyone who's just an avid fan of just military modeling in general. These kits here are just a classic kit and they go together very well and they do have some very nice details on them considering the age of the tooling. Several aspects of this model really have aged quite well considering the era that this kit was released in and it's still, in my opinion, built into a very nice, decent representation of the eight-wheeled armored car. Along similar lines, I would also recommend this kit highly to anyone who's just an avid fan of building and collecting just Tamiya models or just vintage model kits in general. This is indeed a vintage model kit. Even though this kit has been re-released a number of times by Tamiya, tracking them down should not be overly difficult and when found the prices should be somewhat fairly affordable. However, this is still a vintage kit through and through and if you love to build and collect those vintage era models, this one here would be a fantastic addition to add to your collection. And with that, that wraps up this model showcase video for this 135th scale Schwer Panzerspechwagen SDKFZ 232 Achtungraden Armor Car. If you like this video, be sure to subscribe to this channel where it's a great way to keep up to date on new posted content being small scale model showcase videos like this one over here or the other larger scale project update videos that frequently get posted to this channel. Another way to keep in loop of new posted content is by liking us on Facebook. There I have more photographs of this particular build as well as the other smaller and larger scale builds that have been seen on this channel in the past. Furthermore, don't forget to swing by EastCoastArmory.com for more 1.6 and 1.16 scale builds and detail components. Thanks again. I'll be seeing you all again on the next one. Till then.